Listen, I had no idea that Jared Way of My Chemical Romance had written the comic book this show was based on. Like, this dude was writing graphic novels even before Helena when I was a young boy. I had even collected some of these issues, which made me feel so dumb because when I heard their last album, I legit, during that time, didn't even connect that he had written the Killjoys comic. I just thought it was cool he was a comic fan. Well, thanks to Squarespace, I went back and read the two full series that are out so far. Read the free one-off issues that were, like, inspired by MySpace. Binged the series over in order for me to break down to you why I consider this a Netflix buffet. Let me explain. So this show is random. I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean it more in the way that if you're tired of the Marvel formula, then... Here's your winner, mainly because it doesn't stop to explain anything to you. Like, it's one of those shows where it's waiting for you to catch up and realize what's going on. Even when I was reading the comic, like, there was things that would just pop out, like, the wildest names for the issue titles, which I loved because I would just stare at them and think, bro, is it, are these Fall Out Boy songs? But when I say that the show is weird and that I wasn't ready for it, I mean, I went into this thing dry before I had even read the comics and got hit with these clips. A girl flirting with a boy before she goes for a swim only to come out and conceive. She went into straight labor even though just a lap ago she wasn't even pregnant. A 13 year old who's really 85 years old because he's time traveling. This dude walking around with the body of a Minecraft character looking like he loves it. A damn butler who no one even says anything about the fact that he's a chimpanzee. And then this scene. Sorry you're in there for so long, Dolores. No, I'm not drunk. I'm working. So trust me when I say that this is a trippy series. One that I consider a buffet because any of these characters can have their own series going on. They all have enough to be fleshed out. They all kind of feel like they're different genres. So when the Umbrella Academy mashes all of these up together and gives you glimpses, it kind of feels like you put in an Uber Eats at seven different restaurants and you got delivered bits of each of the restaurants, which is dope. But it's also like a really overwhelming, intense thing of flavors. So I can definitely see people thinking it's a masterpiece, while others will think that it has the BBS effect of having way too many setups. Meanwhile, my cartoon self is over here just trying to keep up. Now, I know everyone's giving it the X-Men comparison, especially when you have, you know, Kitty Pride going all white phoenix in this show. But this is more like a series of unfortunate events because they also have a character named Klaus. Like I said, randomly in 1989, 43 women become pregnant who weren't pregnant before, and then this random dude who may or may not be an alien comes in to collect as many as he can and scoops up seven of these kids. That's how this show starts. Now, I'm pretty sure we'll be seeing more of the other 36 kids that didn't get collected. Uh, in the comics, they kind of allude to the fact that a bunch of the kids had just been, like, left alone and they died. And that's why Hargreaves was only able to collect, and I really do mean collect, seven children. So, for the ones that did survive, they may become villains or they may become allies. There's even a theory on why this incident happened, which I'll cover later. But that's something that I don't think will be answered until, like, season five. But while the whole franchise can be told just covering the Umbrella Academy childhood, right? All of the kids just growing up with their superpowers and how they had to deal with the stranger of a father. This show decides, no, nope, let's just jump years into the future when they've all left the academy. Now, there's a lot of storylines going on, so I just want to break down the main one so things don't get too confusing. We have a father who, again, is an alien from another planet, pretending to be a billionaire here on Earth, who knew the world was going to end. And so he collected seven children with superpowers, supposedly raised them the way he did for a purpose, and then orchestrates his own death in the present in order to reunite all of his children that have gone away so that they can come together and save the apocalypse that's going to happen in eight days. Thank you guys for watching. Nah, it gets deeper. And there's so many more things going on. So to break down the Academy, I would kind of look at it from the Hills House perspective and where their family formula or the way that they kind of broke down the siblings was that they each represented a different stage of grief. Well, you could kind of break down the Umbrella Academy by their varying personality types. There is number one, who's also known as Luther or his, you know, superhero name, Space Boy. His power is superhuman strength with absolutely no brains because this dude was duped by his dad into becoming an astronaut so he could go live on the moon and his dad didn't even have a mission for him he literally sent him off to the moon for nothing Lucer also thinks he's a Steve Rogers of the group and wants to lead, not realizing he looks like Beast Boy, again, because he followed daddy's orders, got super hurt on a mission, and then his papa injected him with some ape serum so he could look like a Martian gorilla. 
And now look at him trying to get into this car. I'm gonna be honest with you, Luther ain't my favorite. Number two is Diego, also known as the Kraken, who I, I think is actually one of the better ones. He throws knives really well and is able to hold his breath, which is exactly the power he needs when his ex, who's a cop, won't get back together with him. My man also thinks he's a vigilante, and I'm pretty sure a podcast with Cody Cohen is off time, so there's that. Number three is the Rumor, also known as Allison, and she is the Shirley of the group. Her superpower is listening to Adele and then spreading rumors that actually do come true. I heard that you shut your friend at your friend. But damn does she not know what's being said about her. She becomes an actress who loses her child because she was using her powers on her child and the ex demands full custody. And it's one of those things where like, yeah, I may not like it for other reasons, mainly how she treated Vanya, but like, yeah, y'all ain't mad at these two ladies for using their powers on innocent children. It wasn't like she forced her kid to get her a beer while she watched the game. It was, it was just a lullaby. And aren't lullabies just spells to fall asleep anyways? Number four is Klaus, also known as the Seance. And he seems to be like the crowd favorite. His superpowers include telekinesis and talking to the dead. But because he has PTSD, he's always either in rehab or getting high, which ruins his powers, especially if he's wearing shoes obviously. Dudes like Ezra Miller and Olaf combined, in my opinion, <laughs> if they were both on meth, because sometimes he didn't work for me, and other times I legit thought he had the coolest power I've ever seen in my cartoon life. Number five, um, doesn't even have a name, he's just known as the boy or number five. He can time travel, and he was missing for the 17 years when everyone split up, because he got stuck in the aftermath of the apocalypse while time jumping. He gets involved with this adjustment bureau for time, who hires him as a hitman, and he gets to come back to the present, but in a kid's body, even though he's mentally 58. And oh yeah, if you thought Fred from I Am Legend tweaked a lot, this dude was in a 30 year marriage to a mannequin while he was lost in time. 30 years. They probably renewed their vows at some point. Number six is named Ben, also known as the Horror, who was a shapeshifter who was able to summon monsters from other dimensions to be able to fight. Super dope power, but sadly he dies at what we believe is a teenager since we haven't seen that clip yet. But luckily, even though he's passed, he gets to be a part of the series because, you know, Klaus's power allows him to talk to him. Then there's number seven, Anya, who has absolutely no superpowers at all. All she does is play the violin. She released a book, just like in Hill House, with the tell-all about the family that caused everyone to be mad at her, but there's definitely no bigger backstory to the top-billed actress shown first at the end of every episode. There is. Now, I think it's cool that they're numbered based off the millisecond they were born in, which it's also kind of sad that he did that, and that they're named the Umbrella Academy because of the umbrella store that Reginald first bought when he arrived here. But being as dysfunctional as they are, it just makes everything more difficult, especially when you got these two as well. Now, Cha-Cha and Hazel, yes, there's more characters, are time-traveling assassins that were picked out from book two of the comics and changed a bit for season one. Originally, they were this crazy duo that wore masks around, torturing people just for the hell of it, and somehow, I think they nailed it for the show. First off, Mary, I will oblige to anything you want because I don't know how you still look this great or are making the career shifts that you are. My man Hazel already played Ed Kemper in My Hunter, so you know, he's already set the bar for creepy. But when it comes to their purpose, they've been commissioned to find number five. And then they're also there to make sure that they guard Vanya during her transition. They kidnap Claus along the way. Hazel falls in love with Donut Lady. Cha-Cha kills Diego's ex. Hazel tries to kill Cha-Cha. And then they have, um... And they have dance parties. I mean, like, they really go DreamWorks animation finale with you multiple times. Even though the ending to this one was sick. Now, Vanya's still playing her violin. And she's befriended a student of hers who starts making carvings of Vanya's face. Which, I guess this dude doesn't know anything about The Last of Us. But this guy starts actually creeping and going into her house. But Vanya's never had a friend, so she doesn't really care. Number five then explains how he's been working with this time commission and how he made a deal with the handler. Now, in the comics, the main goal of this commission is to keep the timeline intact. Like I said, they're kind of like the Adjustment Bureau who isn't really looking to stop tragedies. They just want to make sure that everything stays in order. And so they turn number five into their little hitman before he realizes who exactly causes the apocalypse he's been trying to stop. Harold Jenkins. That's, uh... That's the creepy dude Vanya's been with. Five then goes back in time in order to find Harold and pretty much just dissolves the previous episodes from ever happening. So, 
let's talk about these two smashing. Now, I personally think these two are at the bottom of the seven in my personal ranking, you know, and, and that includes having the dead sibling over them. I'm not saying that their relationship adds to why I don't like them, but it definitely makes sense why they would end up together. Obviously, they aren't blood related, so there's this whole group out there cheering for them to be together. Others think it's way too close for comfort, especially if they've been adopted. Like, they're looking at this couple going, please don't even dance in the sunlight. I don't really care about anything this dude does because just look, my man's like Wilson Fisk from Spider-Verse. In all serious though, these guys were brown nosers. Like that's the reason why I just can't stand them. Like Luther got stranded. He got screwed. He got scarred by the things his dad told him to do and he still does them. I haven't really touched upon this robotic mom that they also have who came about because Hargreaves lost the real wife that he had and other nannies couldn't keep up with the powers the kids had so he just created his own Rosie the Maid. But who's really interesting is Pogo, the ape butler. And I mention this because it connects to Luther because it's the same team from Planet of the Apes who designed him, which makes him look super cool and you get fascinated with them. But it's the idea that there's an entire backstory between this Alfred of a monkey butler and his Batman and we don't know what they did. Like, Luther gets injected at a certain point with ape serum, meaning Papa Hargreaves literally has been monking around more than we think, and it just makes me wonder, what else are these two hiding? The most annoying part of these two, though, is how they treated Vanya. See, it turns out that there's a whole childhood that got suppressed that Vanya is now discovering. Like, there's a scene where Harold Jenkins pulls a Jesse Smollett, which allows Vanya to be able to, for the first time, realize what her powers can actually do. We then get these flashbacks where we see that Reginald did in fact know Vanya had powers. In fact, she had the most most powerful powers out of everyone, and so he started feeding her pills to suppress her. Man then uses his other daughter's powers to make her forget things and believe that she's normal. I heard a boomer. I heard a boomer. All because he believes in himself to be this majestic being who's overseeing children's lives and manipulating their powers because he thinks he knows best. Sound familiar? Allison then decides to confront Vanya about this and tell her the truth, but right when Allie was about to pull her rumor trick, Vanya slaps the words out of her mouth and- Oh. Oh, she actually slit her throat. Good luck spreading rumors now, you snitch. Vanya, I can explain. Boy, get out of here. You're getting it too. Luther, being the primate that he is, decides to knock out Vanya instead of being happy that his sister has superpowers, you know? Yeah, she hurt the girl you like, but I mean, the girl you like still breathing. How about, I don't know being happy you can stop the apocalypse? Nope, he instead locks her up and takes his dad's advice. You know, again, the man who stranded you on the moon and gave you a monkey body? Even if you're right, she needs our help, and we can't do that if she's locked in yeah. a cage. Go, Diego, go. Now, some may hear me complaining about Luther and think that I'm just nitpicking, that I'm just being cynical, that I can't get into the story of, boy, I am fully in it. I'm saying these things about Luther because I'm concerned about all the other characters in this world. Like in volume two, let me just rewind a little bit. Y'all do know that he was the last one still slumming it at his house at his parents' house. But in volume two, this guy finds a way to make his ape body fat and just sits on the couch for most of that run. Luther, if I ever find you on the street, I would hire someone to whoop your butt so bad. Number five then returns his lover to the Burlington Coat Factory as they get prepared to stop their sister who just escaped this soundproof room. We get this really cool flashback montage for Anya as she walks around the house remembering how they shunned her and then she just blows it up. Now let me be clear, I don't think Vanya's the villain here. I know she killed Pogo and that kind of sucks, but a character like Jenkins, who was a more cliche villain in the comic, but here in the show gets the Baron Zemo syndrome effect really, where he's upset that they never accepted him into the academy, even though he was born on the same day, just wasn't a part of the 43. Like what he does, that's evil. What Vanya is, is a pressure cooker from bad parenting. Hell, all seven of them are. They finally confront Vanya in their bowling shoes as she reenacts the climax of Eagle Eye and legit turns into the white violin. In the comic, she really becomes a violin, but here she's just this super-powered musician who's about to destroy the world when Allison fires a gun next to her ear and deflects her energy up to the moon. A much better ending than what number five did in the co- Oh. Well, number five then gets the idea to gather everyone before they all get killed, and we see them all become teenagers and then vanish to an unknown time period as everyone else gets deeply impacted. 
So, now what? Well, I had my theories for the other 36 babies that were born, you know, some of them may have died, but I think that there's remaining ones who could become future villains or heroes. There's also the sequence in Volume 2 where Klaus meets God that was kind of paid homage to in the show with Episode 7, but in the book, God straight up tells him that the 43 were collectively the reincarnation of Jesus Christ, the Messiah himself. Now, I don't know what the hell that means, but what I do know is that there's a graphic novel called Punk Rock Jesus. They all gotta read if you like the series even a little bit. There's a chance season two could deal with the villain Perseus, who's this evil CEO whose father was imprisoned by the Academy, and so he's seeking revenge. There's Dr. Termino, who's kind of like their Kraken, who was mentioned in episode seven, and it'd be interesting to see how they invert his cliches and his minions. Maybe the Umbrella Kids will go look for their OG parents or siblings. Maybe two of them may in fact be twins, as was hinted in the show. Is the storyline for season two going to be around JFK since that's what volume two is about? Season one kind of gave us a glimpse of it being one of number five's missions as he was traveling back in time, but could get kind of tricky. For starters, this is a real assassination, so Netflix may avoid it. Uh, it is also Netflix, so probably not. But I just question what would be different if JFK wasn't around. Like, you know, wouldn't there not be a Reagan and... Uh, Claws would be clean. I don't know. But what I do know is that the JFK storyline has one of the craziest twists since the only way for Allison to get her voice back since it's been slit is to make a deal with that time Commission 5 was working with. A deal that forces her to go back in time, pretend to be Jackie Kennedy, and tell the president that she heard a rumor that his head would explode. And if y'all have done any research on the physics of that shooting, that is an insane route to go. Either way, Way's Eisner winning series is set up to be eight volumes long, with the show also aiming to go for eight seasons. They already have an outline for all eight, so they don't have to, you know, Game of Thrones it, but it's clear that they're trusting the fans will want more and that they're gonna be there, that it's going to be this big property. One that can get a spin-off just of number five being lost in time. One of number one being a number two up in the moon. The real backstory to Reginald. A whole breakdown on the time commission, spin-offs for the other 36, pretty much a never-ending selection of stories. Because like I said, it's a buffet. Thank you guys for checking out this video and a big thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring it. You know, when we first made our site, we chose Squarespace because we heard them in another YouTube video and you 100% that they were the ones to go with. As a cartoon, revamping a site with all these up-to-date templates makes it super easy to create a website where we wanna host all of our content. The fact that it's an all-in-one allows us to post different things and it allows us to hire writers to push more articles and videos. It's allowing us to prepare a store to push LME merch, get 24-7 assistance on our cartoon Toonie developments, and the way that it deals with domains and transfers has been a huge help with revitalizing the A to Z show.com. So head over to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash let me explain to save 10% off your first purchase. Big shout out to them for the support, and a big shout out to you guys as well for always watching. I'm curious to know your thoughts on the show. Uh, I'm still so surprised how big the fan base is. Like, I had no idea Alita had that many fans, but like, I, I had even said it in that video towards the ending. I I said, Alita fans are going to come at me for these two things. Guess what they did? It was about the eyes, and I forget what else I said. I'm telling you right now, because uh, mo most of the people who leave these comments don't make it to the end of the video, uh, there are people who are going to call me out on the uh, Jared Way thing, and uh, sure, I'm telling you right now, that's dope. Hey, if you knew Jared Way did comics the moment his pen touched the paper, if you knew it before anyone else, then you know what? You are better than us. You are superior. Uh, yeah, that's, I guess, my only response, because you're going to see those comments, but I'm curious to know, for the people who really love this show, where you think it's going to go, what your theories are, the things that I may have missed, because again, this show has so many threads going on. I'm curious to know your thoughts, and I want to end this one actually with a recommendation because as I was watching the first episode there is a Sundance movie called We Are Little Zombies and We Are Little Zombies is a movie that unless you know about it it may go under your radar and you never know anything about it but this is a movie where I'm telling you right now for the fans of Umbrella Academy if I'll serve one purpose I hope it's this that I could put you onto something else you are going to love We Are Little Zombies so definitely check that out I'll be talking about uh, that movie a little bit more later but it is like so in line with that these four orphans who start a band called We Are Little Zombies and try to say bruh it's crazy uh again thank you guys for watching this video let me know your thoughts all of that and rumor has it that you will comment like and subscribe